Text appears. Content advisory. This video contains fictionalized portrayals of blood, battle wounds, and medical care. Sounds of muskets firing and cannons are also present. Camera travels through the opening hallways in the Guilford Courthouse National Military Park Museum inside of the Visitor Center, showing artifacts. Text reads pacifists in wartime, the Quakers of New Garden. Text overlaid on image of Nathaniel Green Monument at Guilford Courthouse. I'll be your host today. I will be wearing a National Park Service uniform consisting of a gray long sleeve shirt, a green necktie, and green pants. I have brown hair and I am wearing a gray face mask. Hello and welcome to another video commemorating the 240th anniversary of the Battle of Guilford Courthouse here at Guilford Courthouse National Military Park. I'm Ranger Kate and today I'm going to be talking with you about the Quakers of New Garden, a pacifist community caught in the midst of the Revolutionary War. Quakers historically traveled to the new colonies in the 1600s, image shows a woman standing on a platform as she speaks to a crowd. Many listen. The image shows Quakers as they would have appeared in the 1600s in Europe. Originally traveling to the Northeast, many settled in places like Massachusetts or Rhode Island. However, these Quakers began to face severe religious persecution, especially at the hands of the Puritans. Two images from the 1600s show Quaker persecution. On the left, a Quaker's back is whipped with a cat of nine tails. On the right, a Quaker is chained to the stocks as their tongue is removed. Puritans would punish Quakers for their religious beliefs very severely. Some of them would even cut out Quakers' tongues sentenced them to horrific tortures, and some were even hanged. Published in the 1660s, Edward Burroughs, A Declaration of the Sad and Great Persecution and Martyrdom of the People of God Called Quakers in New England for the Worshipping of God appears on screen. One of the most famous Quakers who faced this persecution was Mary Dyer. Now, the Quakers of the 1600s are a little bit different than the Quakers we generally think about today. These Quakers were more aggressive when it came to proselytizing their religion and spreading the word of their beliefs. Mary Dyer was one of the more vocal advocates of the Quaker religion. Because of this, Puritan authorities captured her and imprisoned her, eventually sentencing her to death. Now the first time that Mary Dyer was taken out to the gallows, those in the city, pop-up reads referring to Boston, Massachusetts, were horrified by the idea of hanging this woman. As a result, she was actually rescued by the crowd who walked her out of the city. But Mary Dyer wasn't done. Mary Dyer knew that her fellow Quakers who had been sentenced alongside her that day had already been hanged as well. Because of this, she went back, advocating for the presence of Quakers within these Puritan communities. She was once again captured and once again sentenced to death. 19th century painting shows Mary Dyer being escorted to the gallows by a group of soldiers as civilians watch. And this time, there was no escape for Mary Dyer. As she was escorted out to the gallows this final time, drummers reportedly loudly played to drown out any last words she might have had. Once she reached the gallows, it was over. Now this persecution only continued, and other colonies began to look very appealing to these Quakers suffering under such harsh treatment. North Carolina, then a brand new colony, had just included in its charter in the early 1700s that religious freedom was a guarantee for its settlers. Because of this, many Quakers traveled from Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and all of those other northern colonies down the Great Wagon Road to settle in places where they wouldn't be persecuted so harshly. Map of the Great Wagon Road from Pennsylvania to North Carolina, mapped originally by J.A. Lewis. As a result, Communities like New Garden sprang up. New Garden itself would be recognized as an official community in the early 1750s. 18th century map of North Carolina slowly zooms in on the Quaker community at New Garden. Now before them, there were other Quaker settlements. There was one at Deep River Meeting House, and there were others closer to the coast of the Carolinas. However, these coastal Quaker communities and the communities here in the Piedmont area often did not interact very much. While they frequently exchanged letters, travel was difficult between the coast and the western half of the state. This was because of difficult elevation changes and very unmanageable terrain. 
it was actually easier to travel all the way from Pennsylvania down to this region by road than it would be to take a ship to the coast and move inward over land. Once settled, the Quakers of New Garden took up many different trades. Some were farmers, others opened grist mills, grinding grain for their communities. Transcription of historical document reads on petition of William Coffin praying leave to build a grist mill over Horsepen Creek on his own land, ordered that the same lie over until next port for consideration. Yet others became craftsmen and artisans. Some brought their Pennsylvania influences into their new crafts. Painted face of a grandfather clock, text reads courtesy of Mesta, zooms out to show more of the body of the grandfather clock. Image changes to a Pennsylvania-inspired dresser created by a Quaker of New Garden. Image changes to a surveyor's compass created by silversmith Cam Moore. The face of the compass says Guilford NC, made by C. Moore. Quaker artisans created beautiful furniture that was clearly inspired by those earlier settlements in the Northeast. Cam Moore was a Quaker in New Garden. He developed his skill in silversmithing, eventually crafting compasses that were well-renowned for their beauty and functionality and their reliability. Now, when tensions began to rise leading up to the Revolutionary War, the Quakers faced a difficult situation. Their religious beliefs advocated stringently for pacifism. They could not align themselves with either side. In fact, those found providing aid to one side over the other could be excommunicated from the Quaker Society of Friends. In fact, Society of Friends Quakers here in North Carolina began to notice a severe uptick in removals from their groups, especially as the Revolutionary War closed in. At least five or six members of the New Garden community were exiled from the Society of Friends due to taking up arms. Portrait of Nathaniel Green. General Nathaniel Green, born and raised a Quaker in Rhode Island, was actually removed from his Society of Friends because of his support of the revolutionary cause. Green Monument. He attended musters and eventually even developed his own militia unit, the Kentish Guards. Painting shows Nathaniel Green on horseback leading soldiers. Text reads, Green was a founding member of the group. While it is erroneous to call Nathaniel Green a fighting Quaker because he was removed from the Society of Friends, this will become important later after the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, so keep that in mind. Now, the days leading up to the battle were hard for the Quaker community in New Garden. Excerpt from Historical Journal discusses tax increase on Quakers, including 1781's taxes of over 4,134 pounds. Stringent taxes had raised nearly triple the regular average in order to penalize the community for refusing to participate in enlistments and conscriptions. And the Quakers of New Garden were under immense financial strain already. Additionally, roving robbers who were not affiliated with either side would often steal uniforms and raid homes under the guise of foraging for the army. Bethel Coffin and his wife Hannah experienced this firsthand. One night, as they sat by the fireside, tending to their young children, a loud knock sounded on their front door. Two men demanded entry, and Bethel and Hannah feared for their lives, along with the lives of their infant children. Eventually, Bethel managed to talk the men down, and although they had arrived intent on stealing their belongings and valuables, they eventually left the premises and instead raided one of their neighbor's homes. This would not be the last occurrence of violence and confusion for the pacifist community of New Garden. In fact, on the morning of March 15, 1781, a series of skirmishes erupted throughout the streets of the New Garden community as cavalry units from the British Army and the Continental Army faced off in the middle of this pacifistic community. Now this action took place so closely to their homes that young Jonathan Jessup, then only 10 years old, drew a map of what he experienced on that day. And on that map, you can clearly see that his house was right next to one of these skirmishes. Now the New Garden Meeting House was the center of the community. This was their place of worship. Quakers did not practice worship as we traditionally think of. 
Quakers would meet for silent meditation, and you would only speak when you experienced a form of internal divine enlightenment. Crowded outdoor scene near a two-story wooden building that is the Quaker Meeting House at New Garden. You would share your thoughts and encourage community members to reflect on what you had offered. It was a sacred space, but soon the effects of the skirmish would leave blood on its floorboards. Three times violence punctuated the morning in New Garden, and after the soldiers left, heading towards Guilford Courthouse, the Quakers were left to bring in the wounded and begin treating those who had been left behind. Clips from the Park film and other such victories show wounded British soldiers and Continental soldiers as they are treated by Quakers. Brought into a single-story log home. Many walk around outside. Some who had been killed during that morning were buried along the roadside where they lay. Others, still alive, were brought into local homes. Jonathan Jessup's family was one of those homes who hosted soldiers wounded in those morning skirmishes. Now, the Battle of Guilford Courthouse was just a few miles up the road, and scattered Quaker homes lined the area. Quaker Thomas White White's house on a map. was one of those who lived closer to the battlefield. At the time, his wife was eight months pregnant when the battle broke out within a mile of their home. The couple reportedly hid within their cellar, attempting to shelter against the violence outside. These experiences would only continue. In fact, Elijah Coffin, portrait of a man in a suit who looks to be about 50 years old, reported that a young man ran to his family's home and knocked on the door, begging for entry. His mother, Hannah, opened the door and was greeted with the sight of a soldier we are not sure what side the soldier was on, but he had lost two fingers on one of his hand. Now, could this be Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton of the British Legion? We don't know. There are actually other accounts from pension records of soldiers who lost hands during this fight as well. The text reads hands and or fingers. Many because of musket shots that completely removed fingers and left shattered remains behind. After the battle, difficulties did not end. The following sequences contain clips from another such victory that show medical care provided by the Quakers within a Quaker home. British soldiers limp around. In fact, with many, many wounded soldiers left behind, the Quakers, because of their neutrality, were expected to care for soldiers of both sides. The majority of those taken into Quaker homes and the Quaker Meeting House would be British. However, they also took care of continental casualties and members of the militia in need of help. It is reported that communities within 10 miles of the battlefield were stuffed full of casualties of this battle. Men struggling to recover from life-changing wounds. Within the Quaker Meeting House, surgeons from both the British and the Continental Army attempted to provide aid as the Quakers also provided medical assistance. Amputations used for compound fractures of bone breaking the skin, now so easy to treat today, actually had a mortality rate of between 50 and 75 percent during this period. Other surgery was rudimentary at best. Many surgeons still believed in the idea of the four humors. 18th century image of scarificator, leeches, and bleeding tools. Believing treatments like bleeding or blistering were the key to treating serious injuries. Extracting bullets was another dangerous procedure. Unsanitized conditions could lead to rampant infections, gangrene, and death. But what were these soldiers eating? Well, the Quakers had to provide all of those resources. After the battle, Nathaniel Green knew that this burden on the Quakers would be extreme. Excerpt from Nathaniel Green's letter addressed to the Quakers of New Garden. He appealed to them as a former Quaker himself asking them to care for the soldiers, and remembering that he too understood their doctrines, understood the burden. Excerpt of Quaker response. The Quakers of New Garden responded, agreeing to take care of the soldiers, but stressing that it would not be an easy task in a landscape already ravaged and pillaged for years. Triani painting of British looting a house and setting it on fire. To truly show how much the Quakers gave to these soldiers, this is an excerpt from General Charles Cornwallis's personal papers. New Garden Quaker contributions, March 21st, William Coffin Jr. won beef 100 pounds, March 23rd, William Coffin Sr. beef 165 pounds, 
March 25th, Thomas Thornberry, beef, 140 pounds. March 27th, Silas Williams, beef, 120 pounds. March 29th, Henry Safright, beef, 120 pounds. March 31st, John Kennedy, beef, 74 pounds. April 3rd, Ellen Unthanks, beef, 140 pounds. April 4th, William Coffin Sr., 4 pounds of hog's lard. April 6th, Isaiah Hunt, beef, 80 pounds. William Coffin Sr., flour, 6 bushels. Thomas Thornberry, 2 fowls, 2 dozen eggs. John Kennedy, 1 sheep, 2 fowls, milk. Howell, 1 bushel, meal, and milk. Perkins, one bushel meal and milk, plus two fowls. Pritchard, two fowls and milk. George Eddings, one crate of flour. Thomas Kendall, one pound of candles. George Hyatt, two bushels of meal. Thomas Pierce, two fowls, one pound of candles. John Ballinger, one bushel of meal, two fowls. Enoch Macy, two fowls, eggs and milk. Which shows a log of all of the resources brought by the community to provide for the casualties. Food, bandages, cloth. All of these things were necessary and would remain necessary for weeks. Tragically, not all of these wounded men survived, especially in an era without modern medicine. As a result, many were buried behind the meeting house in a mass grave. Old image from the 1800s of the New Garden Cemetery, courtesy of the North Carolina Museum of History. This is marked at the New Garden Cemetery near Guilford College today. The Quakers of New Garden would persevere. Despite this drain on their resources, they would survive and they would provide. This was not without consequence. Diseases such as smallpox, historical image of Aztecs suffering from smallpox, often followed the army. And in fact, armies were often considered vectors of disease during this period due to the immense amount of travel. And often they would travel to fairly isolated communities with limited previous exposure to diseases like smallpox. Because of this, we know of at least one Quaker family and one man named Richard Williams who left behind six children. Text reads including his children over 18, Williams and his wife Prudence had 12 children. And after his exposure and ensuing death because of smallpox brought into his home by casualties treated within his household. How did the Quaker community at New Garden move on from this? They persevered. They managed to scrape together enough resources to provide for their own families and these wounded soldiers. This community has a rich history and many still identify as Quakers here in Greensboro. After the war, the Quaker community of New Garden would thrive for a time, although many would leave and migrate north to Indiana. Those who remained were heavily involved in abolitionist movements and eventually would be a part of the Underground Railroad. They leave behind a rich legacy and a rich history that is often overlooked and we are glad to highlight the contributions of these pacifists in wartime who gave so much to others in a great time of need. Thank you for watching this video and remember, keep an eye on our social media for more content that commemorates the 240th anniversary of the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. Thanks for watching.